The Brothers Karamazov Novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky Narrated by Andrew Originally published in 1880 This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Book 3 The Sensualists Chapter 1 In the Servants' Quarters The Karamazov's house was far from being in the center of the town, but it was not quite outside it. It was a pleasant-looking old house of two stories, painted gray, with a red iron roof. It was roomy and snug, and might still last many years. There were all sorts of unexpected little cupboards and closets and staircases. There were rats in it, but Fyodor Pavlovich did not altogether dislike them. One doesn't feel so solitary when one's left alone in the evening, he used to say. It was his habit to send the servants away to the lodge for the night and to lock himself up alone. The lodge was a roomy and solid building in the yard Fyodor Pavlovich used to have the cooking done there, although there was a kitchen in the house. He did not like the smell of cooking, and, winter and summer alike, the dishes were carried in across the courtyard. The house was built for a large family. There was room for five times as many, with their servants. But at the time of our story there was no one living in the house but Fyodor Pavlovich and his son Ivan. And in the lodge there were only three servants, old Grigory and his old wife Marfa, and a young man called Smerdyakov. Of these three we must say a few words. Of old Grigory we have said something already. He was firm and determined and went blindly and obstinately for his object. If once he had been brought by any reasons, and they were often very illogical ones, to believe that it was immutably right. He was honest and incorruptible. His wife, Marfa Ignatyevna, had obeyed her husband's will implicitly all her life yet she had pestered him terribly after the emancipation of the serfs. She was set on leaving Fyodor Pavlovich and opening a little shop in Moscow with their small savings. But Grigory decided then, once for all, that the woman's talking nonsense for every woman is dishonest, and that they ought not to leave their old master, whatever he might be. For that was now their duty. Do you understand what duty is? He asked Marfa Ignatyevna. I understand what duty means, Grigory Vasilyevich, but why it's our duty to stay here I never shall understand, Marfa answered firmly. Well, don't understand then. But so it shall be, and you hold your tongue. And so it was. They did not go away, and Fyodor Pavlovich promised them a small sum for wages, and paid it regularly. Grigory knew, too, that he had an indisputable influence over his master. It was true, and he was aware of it. Fyodor Pavlovich was an obstinate and cunning buffoon. Yet, though his will was strong enough in some of the affairs of life, as he expressed it, he found himself, to his surprise, extremely feeble and facing certain other emergencies. He knew his weaknesses and was afraid of them. There are positions in which one has to keep a sharp lookout. And that's not easy without a trustworthy man and Grigory was a most trustworthy man. Many times in the course of his life Fyodor Pavlovich had only just escaped a sound thrashing through Grigory's intervention, and on each occasion the old servant gave him a good lecture. But it wasn't only thrashings that Fyodor Pavlovich was afraid of. There were graver occasions, and very subtle and complicated ones, when Fyodor Pavlovich could not have explained the extraordinary craving for someone faithful and devoted which sometimes unaccountably came upon him all in a moment. It was almost a morbid condition, corrupt and often cruel in his lust. Like some noxious insect, Fyodor Pavlovich was sometimes, in moments of drunkenness, overcome by superstitious terror and a moral convulsion which took an almost physical form. My soul simply quaking in my throat at those times, he used to say. At such moments he liked to feel that there was near at hand, in the lodge if not in the room, a strong, faithful man, virtuous and unlike himself, who had seen all his debauchery and knew all his secrets, but was ready in his devotion to overlook all that, not to oppose him, above all, not to reproach him or threaten him with anything, either in this world or in the next, and in case of need, to defend him, 
From whom? From somebody unknown, but terrible and dangerous. What he needed was to feel that there was another man, an old and tried friend, that he might call him in his sick moments merely to look at his face, or, perhaps, exchange some quite irrelevant words with him. And if the old servant were not angry, he felt comforted, and if he were angry, he was more dejected. It happened even, very rarely, however, that Fyodor Pavlovich went at night to the lodge to wake Grigory and fetch him for a moment. When the old man came, Fyodor Pavlovich would begin talking about the most trivial matters and would soon let him go again, sometimes even with a jest. And after he had gone, Fyodor Pavlovich would get into bed with a curse and sleep the sleep of the just. Something of the same sort had happened to Fyodor Pavlovich on Alyosha's arrival. Alyosha pierced his heart by living with him, seeing everything and blaming nothing. Moreover, Alyosha brought with him something his father had never known before. A complete absence of contempt for him and an invariable kindness, a perfectly natural unaffected devotion to the old man who deserved it so little. All this was a complete surprise to the old profligate who had dropped all family ties. It was a new and surprising experience for him, who had till then loved nothing but evil. When Alyosha had left him, he confessed to himself that he had learnt something he had not till then been willing to learn. I have mentioned already that Grigory had detested Adelaida Ivanovna, the first wife of Fyodor Pavlovich and the mother of Dmitri, and that he had, on the contrary, protected Sofia Ivanovna, the poor, crazy woman, against his master and anyone who chanced to speak ill or lightly of her. His sympathy for the unhappy wife had become something sacred to him, so that even now, twenty years after, he could not bear a slighting allusion to her from anyone, and would at once check the offender. Externally, Grigory was cold, dignified and taciturn, and spoke, weighing his words, without frivolity. It was impossible to tell at first sight whether he loved his meek, obedient wife, but he really did love her, and she knew it. Marfa Ignatyevna was by no means foolish. She was probably, indeed, cleverer than her husband, or at least, more prudent than he in worldly affairs, and yet she had given in to him in everything without question or complaint ever since her marriage, and respected him for his spiritual superiority. It was remarkable how little they spoke to one another in the course of their lives, and only of the most necessary daily affairs. The grave and dignified Grigory thought over all his cares and duties alone, so that Marfa Ignatyevna had long grown used to knowing that he did not need her advice. She felt that her husband respected her silence and took it as a sign of her good sense. He had never beaten her but once, and then only slightly. Once during the year after Fyodor Pavlovich's marriage with Adelaida Ivanovna, the village girls and women, at that time serfs, were called together before the house to sing and dance. They were beginning in the green meadows, when Marfa, at that time a young woman, skipped forward and danced the Russian dance, not in the village fashion, but as she had danced it when she was a servant in the service of the rich Mayasov family, in their private theater where the actors were taught to dance by a dancing master from Moscow. Grigory saw how his wife danced, and, an hour later, at home in their cottage he gave her a lesson, pulling her hair a little. But there it ended. The beating was never repeated, and Marfa Ignatyevna gave up dancing. God had not blessed them with children. One child was born but it died. Grigory was fond of children, and was not ashamed of showing it. When Adelaida Ivanovna had run away, Grigory took Dmitri, then a child of three years old, combed his hair and washed him in a tub with his own hands, and looked after him for almost a year. Afterwards he had looked after Ivan and Alyosha, for which the general's widow had rewarded him with a slap in the face, but I have already related all that. The only happiness his own child had brought him had been in the anticipation of its birth. When it was born, he was overwhelmed with grief and horror. The baby had six fingers. Grigory was so crushed by this that he was not only silent till the day of the christening, but kept away in the garden. It was spring, and he spent three days digging the kitchen garden. The third day was fixed for christening the baby, 
Meantime Grigory had reached a conclusion. Going into the cottage where the clergy were assembled and the visitors had arrived, including Fyodor Pavlovich, who was to stand godfather, he suddenly announced that the baby ought not to be christened at all. He announced this quietly, briefly, forcing out his words and gazing with dull intentness at the priest. Why not? asked the priest with Gudamord surprise. Because it's a dragon, muttered Grigory. A dragon? What dragon? Grigory did not speak for some time. It's a confusion of nature, he muttered vaguely, but firmly, and obviously unwilling to say more. They laughed, and of course christened the poor baby. Grigory prayed earnestly at the font, but his opinion of the newborn child remained unchanged. Yet he did not interfere in any way. As long as the sickly infant lived he scarcely looked at it, tried indeed not to notice it, and for the most part kept out of the cottage. But when, at the end of a fortnight, the baby died of thrush, he himself laid the child in its little coffin, looked at it in profound grief, and when they were filling up the shallow little grave, he fell on his knees and bowed down to the earth. He did not for years afterwards mention his child, nor did Marfa speak of the baby before him, and, even if Grigory were not present, she never spoke of it above a whisper. Marfa observed that, from the day of the burial, he devoted himself to religion, and took to reading the lives of the saints, for the most part sitting alone and in silence, and always putting on his big, round, silver-rimmed spectacles. He rarely read aloud, only perhaps in Lent. He was fond of the Book of Job, and had somehow got hold of a copy of the sayings and sermons of the God-fearing Father Isaac the Syrian, which he read persistently for years together, understanding very little of it, but perhaps prizing and loving it the more for that. Of late, he had begun to listen to the doctrines of the sect of flagellants settled in the neighborhood. He was evidently shaken by them, but judged it unfitting to go over to the new faith. His habit of theological reading gave him an expression of still greater gravity. He was perhaps predisposed to mysticism, and the birth of his deformed child and its death had, as though by special design, been accompanied by another strange and marvelous event, which, as he said later, had left a stamp upon his soul. It happened that, on the very night after the burial of his child, Marfa was awakened by the wail of a newborn baby. She was frightened and waked her husband. He listened and said he thought it was more like someone groaning, it might be a woman. He got up and dressed. It was a rather warm night in May. As he went down the steps, he distinctly heard groans coming from the garden. But the gate from the yard into the garden was locked at night, and there was no other way of entering it, for it was enclosed all round by a strong, high fence. Going back into the house, Grigory lighted a lantern, took the garden key, and taking no notice of the hysterical fears of his wife, who was still persuaded that she heard a child crying, and that it was her own baby crying and calling for her, went into the garden in silence. There he heard at once that the groans came from the bathhouse that stood near the garden gate, and that they were the groans of a woman. Opening the door of the bathhouse, he saw a sight which petrified him. An idiot girl, who wandered about the streets and was known to the whole town by the nickname of Lizavita Smirdiaskia, stinking Lizavita, had got into the bathhouse and had just given birth to a child. She lay dying with the baby beside her. She said nothing, for she had never been able to speak. But her story needs a chapter to itself. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.